My name is Patrick Brundon, and I will be hosting this webinar. And this webinar uh, today is focused on genetic markers and the progression of Parkinson's disease. As usual, we have some sponsors, Cure Parkinson's from the United Kingdom, Journal of Parkinson's Disease, and uh, finally, um, Van Andel Institute. And that's actually where I am based. I am in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, I have a great panel who will be discussing with us for the next 60 minutes. I'm uh, about to let them introduce themselves. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you how you can interact live with this panel. There are well over 100 of you listening in right now, and you're able to open the window that's called Q&A in Zoom and type in a question at any time during this webinar. We'll be monitoring the uh, incoming questions. We tried to group them maybe, and then we will ask them to the panelists at a good point in the discussion. We, we usually get very vibrant discussions and lots of questions, and therefore sometimes we're not able to answer all the questions. And we will then try to get back to you afterwards, either via email or somehow you know, online. Finally, before we have the introduction of the panelists, I want to uh, emphasize that you can listen to this webinar again. It's going to be posted on a YouTube channel, usually about 24 hours after it ends. All right, time to introduce the panel or to have them introduce themselves. I'm going to introduce them the way I see them in my Zoom screen. And I see Jesse Kivney. Hi, my name is Jesse Keefney, and um, I'm a carrier of a variant called LARC2 G2019S. And I was also a care partner for my dad who had Parkinson's. Thank you, Jesse. And then I see Mark Cookson. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Cookson. I'm at the National Institute on Aging in Bethesda, Maryland, in the USA. I'm the acting lab chief for the Laboratory of Neurogenetics, where we study LARC2 and other causes of Parkinson's. Thank you, Mark. And Clement Schutzer. Hi, th thank you, Patrick, for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Clement Schutzer. I uh, direct the Center for Advanced Parkinson Research and the Precision Neurology Program here at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Thank you, Clements. And finally, we have Stephen Mullen. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Stephen Mullen. I'm an academic neurologist at the University of Plymouth. Um, my particular interest is the GBA gene. Um, I ran a um, small phase two trial of a drug called Ambroxyl, um, and I also run a website called PD Frontline, which is trying to um, genotype people in readiness for future clinical trials involving GBA. Thank you, Stephen. And perhaps I can fire the first question at you, Stephen. You are a clinical neurologist seeing patients. And since the theme of today's webinar is genetics and progression of the disease, what do we mean by progression in Parkinson's disease? How can one measure it? And are there different types of symptoms that will progress in diff at different rates? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, 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 as anyone who, who has Parkinson or knows someone with Parkinson's will, will tell you, um, there's not, no two Parkinson's patients seem to be alike. Um, and people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's can progress at very different rates. Um, and they can also have progression of different features. Um, so for instance, you, you can have a situation where somebody has Parkinson's, which is solely with a tremor, that's called tremor predominant Parkinson's. Um, and you don't really get many other features at all of, of Parkinson's. Um, and the tremor may may well get worse and, and Traditionally, those patients are thought to have a, a sort of better prognosis in the long term. Um, conversely, you can have people who develop Parkinson's and um, progress very quickly. Um, and you can have, um, for instance, memory problems, hallucinations associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, th those seem to be more common in, in certain genetic forms of Parkinson's, like, like GBA. There are Parkinson's patients who have more what's called postural symptoms, so symptoms related to balance and also symptoms related to blood pressure control. And there's a whole sort of gamut of features in between. And I guess that's the sort of challenge of Parkinson's. We sort of call it one disease, but really there is a feeling in the field that actually it may be many sort of diseases which are sort of grouped together by a core set of symptoms which were first diagnosed in the 19th century. 
So do you think that if you see a patient who's been newly diagnosed, could you, after about a month, predict how that patient will do based on their clinical features? Um, I think probably no, although you can certainly get a feeling about them. I mean, it's complicated a little bit by the fact that, for instance, if patients fall within the first two years of diagnosis, then you get a bit suspicious that they may have an alternative diagnosis like um, progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a sort of related Parkinsonian symptom. If they have lots of blood pressure problems, they may have multi-system atrophy. Um, I think it would be very hard in the first months to get a sense of where they're going, but I think certainly after the first year or so, then you, you can often get a sense that, you know, this looks pretty, pretty benign or conversely, this looks like it's progressing quite quickly. So there was a, or there has been a great effort trying to group patients based on how they appear in the first year. And I think there was a great deal of optimism a few years ago that one could identify clusters. And then there's been some skepticism in the literature, right? So I don't know, Clemens, do you want to comment on this? The, the notion that there were very, very clear subtypes, the tremor dominant, which Steve, Stephen yeah. mentioned, versus the postural instability gait disorder type of patient. Does that still hold? Right. Well, I, I think this our view is really in flux, and it's you know it it really depends on uh, the level of evidence and and the types of data these um, assumptions are based on. I think sort of in the big scheme of thing, there is generally there is a value uh, to see whether a patient is tremor predominant or gait predominant. Uh, for clinical purposes, for clinical care purposes, I think it gives you a general direction, but um, it's, you know, it lacks the precision one would like to have to really make a predictive and precise um, uh, assessments. For example, we looked, it was a kind of an interesting and in a way surprising exercise we did in our Harvard biomarker study, where we thought, well, let's just, uh, so we're following this 3000 patients over time, and tremor is one of the things we're monitoring, right? And so we, we thought, well, let's see how really tremor severity um, is charting, is tracking over the years in individual patients. And, 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 and so surprisingly, uh, to me at least, tremor actually was one of the few symptoms that on average actually de decreased um, uh, over time. And, and 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 you know it uh, it it really um, varied greatly between patients. So um, I think it's that that also shows you the problem, right? If the symptoms uh, symptom of tremor predominant is decreasing over time, it depends when you see the patient the first time, right? Do you see him or her uh, when the tremor has already disappeared or? Not a, it hasn't become severe yet, so it's it's um, it's a rough clinical estimate. And what I tell my patients um, is that you know we're working on precise prediction, but at the moment, really, all we can do is sort of have a rule of thumb, and that is uh, if we look back at how have you progressed over the last few years, that's typically sort of a good average estimate to predict how you will be. Pro progressing over the next years. So you're essentially saying that an individual can jump between the different categories during the course of the disease? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that makes it very complicated when trying to use the information because, uh, well, yeah. you and don't really belong to one category or another. And, and there was a paper that came out, I think, uh, last week that discusses a different method to assessing these clinical phenotypes using advanced mathematics. And we talked about it just a few minutes ago before we went live, and we haven't all read the details of this, but it was a study where the investigators looked at patients from the PPMI cohort. So this is a uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation funded group of individuals where they try to identify prognostic markers uh, in people at risk or already diagnosed with Parkinson's. And they use some fancy maths following about 450 people here. Do you, can you say just a couple of words about this, Clemens? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Because we... um, well, actually, I very much like this approach. This is really one of the things uh, 
we do, and I really think this is the way to do science, is to look at the totality of data, get all the data, and then let the data tell you what is important and what changes. And, and so I like their approach to look at all the clinical um, data points and, and use um, machine learning to, to identify cluster of, clusters of patients with certain constellations of symptoms. And, and um, so I think that's a great way to do it. Uh, this, in a way, this is a pilot study or, um, and you know, other people have done similar studies. Uh, um, really, we, you want to see this in tens of thousands of patients. And then I think we're gonna start homing in into uh, what is really uh, important. So it's a beginning and early finding and you're suggesting it needs uh, replication in larger cohorts yeah absolutely yeah. but it's an interesting method so the maths allows the uh, uh, the data to be analyzed over time also so it's not they're not categorized only at the beginning but several times so you mentioned in your answer to my question uh, before Clemens that this can be valuable when planning care for an individual patient knowing a little bit about the prognosis but there's also clearly value in research, knowing whether or not a patient is likely to develop, for example, cognitive decline or dementia. Uh, if one is testing a drug that's supposed to inhibit dementia, it would be best only to test it in patients who are likely to develop that soon. So do you think that's one area where this prediction of progression can be particularly helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you want to have predictive scores uh, for really initially for clinical trials to identify uh, rapid progressors that you can enroll into a clinical trial because slow progressors really don't add information to a, a clinical trial. They, they want, they're progressing fortunately so slowly that it, 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 you won't have a readout to see whether your drug is actually working in this patient. So you need to look at rapid progressors, see if your drug can uh, move them from, from fast to slow progression. And, and, and for, I think for that, uh, for enrichment of clinical trials, um, uh, clinical or genetic scores or omic scores will be uh, very important. And, and in fact, we, um, we developed a, sort of an, a, a versatile prototype of a clinical genetic uh, risk score that, that can uh, predict uh, cognitive decline with, with, uh, with, with great accuracy based on, on six clinical features and one genetic feature. And you mentioned this, that it's hard to, to uh, design trials unless the patients actually show deterioration within a limited period of time. And that's related to cost. Maybe Stephen, you could say something about this because you've been working with drugs where you try to slow progression. And uh, if you have a small number of patients, you must have a great change in the patients during the interval that you're studying. And what is the shortest time one can study patients with potentially disease modifying? Um, Patrick, you just cut out the last, last two, two words. Sorry, so to see a signal, if you want to see if a drug is working, you know, what do you think is the shortest time frame? Are we talking about one year, two years? Um, well, if you want to see if you're slowing progression of disease. It, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? And I'm not sure anyone's really come to a, a definitive answer for this. I mean, as, as was touched on before, enriching your, your sample in, um, you know, in people who you know are going to perhaps progress a bit faster. So, so GBA cases are the sort of prime example are, are you know, is would shorten that duration. Um, it, it, I guess it also depends on what you would consider a clinically meaningful sort of change in the score, which is called the UPDRS that we, we, we use for clinical trials. I think, it's generally accepted a year is probably going to be too short. Um, and I think most people say it's anywhere between between um, three and five years. Um, I mean, genetics works the other way, of course. I mean, the, there is some data that says that LARC2 variants progress more slowly. And if that's the case, then actually you're gonna need a larger number of people in order to run those trials, which is problematic because LARC2 cases are rare. Um, so, um, I mean, to my mind, perhaps the best guide to how, as, as um, Clemens alluded to, to how someone's going to progress 
in the future is not necessarily their, um, you know, their genetic markers at present, but actually how they've that how they've progressed up to this point. So actually, if you can have good um, clinical measurement of how people have progressed over the two or three years before the trial, that might be a better way of ensuring that you have the right patients in the trial, rather than at this stage we're relying on sort of genetic genetic kind of models, which you know seem to work, although there is a bit of debate and a bit of variation in, in what's being found between different groups, I think. So I think you teed up a question that I would like to ask Jesse, and I'd like to ask it in, in two parts, really, and I'll present both. First of all, as an individual with a family affected by Parkinson's disease, how important do you see uh, knowing what the likely rate of progression is? Is it important at all? Do you want to know? That's my first question. So this is unrelated to the research project and so forth. And then secondly, could you describe your own personal story with your father and the LARC2 mutation? It, because I think it tells us something very, very important. Yes, um, you know, I actually think it's very important. You know, I think individuals really do wanna know. Um, I'm the type of person, I, I, I have more anxiety of fear of the unknown. The more that I know, the better I feel. And so um, the more I can prepare. So I, I think it's a very important question. Um, and a lot of people do have those questions and wanna know about their, themselves. Um, but then we're constantly reminded that individuals are not averages. You know, there's a lot of variability. And I think my dad's case um, is important to kind of highlight that because with my dad, he had the LARC2 G 2019 S variant, and that is thought to be slower progressing, less incidence of dementia, um, to be a milder kind of phenotype. And for the first 10 years, that's the way it was. He had primarily a tremor, um, and he continued to work, and he lived well. Um, but then, actually, as what um, Clemens was mentioning earlier, his tremor, you know, really kind of almost was absent, it declined. Um, and he had a lot more falls, a lot more autonomic problems, a lot of cognitive impairment. Um, and he started to decline a lot quicker. And so um, he, he passed away earlier this year. And, you know, the pathology in his brain showed that he had very diffuse Lewy body disease. And so he had a very severe pathology. He had some beta amyloid and tau pathology in addition to the widespread alpha synuclein. And so, um, you know, he is, his case was um, clinically and pathologically looked like Parkinson's disease dementia. And so, um, you know, it just goes to show, show you that, you know, you can start out one way and, and you can change and it may not be a constant, um, it may not look the same throughout your, your whole course of your disease. And so it's very, very complicated. And we, I don't know that we've figured out all of the different genetic factors, environmental factors that kind of on an individual basis might um, impact the course of someone's individual disease. And I think that's a great point and something I want to come to uh, in the second half of our webinar, you know, how an individual actually potentially influence the rate of progression. There's no hard data there, of course. But you illustrate something uh, remarkable. So your father, if he had known early on that he had this uh, LARC2 mutation, he would have been told perhaps you are likely to have a slower progression. We just heard this before. Uh, but he ended up having more rapid progression and he ended up having Lewy bodies in many parts of the brain. And about half of patients with this mutation, I believe, don't have any Lewy pathology. So it's very difficult to know. So that's why I wonder, being told something is likely to lead to rapid or slow progression. At an individual level, it's still, there's a toss of a coin somewhere, right? So you want to know, but it's a difficult knowledge to handle because it may not be true. And Mark, you are a leading expert on log two mutations. Can you explain? And I know the answer is no, because nobody can explain, but can you speculate? Why is there individual variation? Here we have a single point mutation in one gene. Why on earth don't all those patients look the same? 
Yeah. As, you, as you correctly surmised, Professor Brunden, no, the answer is no, I don't know. And gosh, I wish I did. Um, I mean, listening to your, your story, Jesse, about your father, I, I mean, that that occurs within a single, I mean, we, we have pedigrees where diffuse Lewy body disease or Parkinson's with dementia is, is, is an outcome for individuals. And yet within the same family, within the same cause, um, there will be people who don't get Parkinson's, even motor Parkinson's tremor until the age of 90 when they're, you know, something else happens to them and they die without disease. Um, and so that range of outcomes is, I, I, I actually, there are very few examples of quite that extreme. Um, GBA is another interesting one, and maybe we can talk a bit more about that later. So, and, and yet the reason we study genetics, a, a friend of mine said the other day, is because it's easy. We can go sequence people and their sequence will be the same every time we sequence them. You, you know, there's not going to be any variants. The, um, the, it's, it's deterministic in the sense of it is with us from birth, but it's non-deterministic in terms of what our clinical outcome is going to be. So I think, you know, an ongoing challenge for the field um, is to really drill in on some of those other things that, that are modifying disease presentation and cost. Um, within LERC2, there have been some, some uh, recent studies that have identified some things that shift your chance a little bit one way or the other, but there's nothing really um, that explains the range of outcomes that we know of in, in families like Jesse's, unfortunately. So that's an excellent answer. Jesse, I just want to let you know that you are now being tweeted by the Deputy Director of Research from Cure Parkinson. Simon Stott just tweeted a quote from you, which I think will be a classic quote. It says, individuals are not averages. I think that's yeah. a very, very important point. And Parkinson's disease is really a, an amazing illustration of this. And of course, we see it with many, many other disorders and diseases. COVID-19 is another example where we don't understand why some people get very, very ill and suffer fatal disease and others don't barely notice that they carry the virus. So um, but, I think, but I yes, I can no, just, uh, yes. interject something here. Um, so I just wanna be clear about that um, uh, predicting is the outcomes of patient is one uh, aim for the future, but it goes hand in hand with prevention. So you want to predict and prevent. And what I mean by that is we want to identify a precise uh, drug target, the disease, precise disease driver in each patient and uh, develop targeted drug uh, to this target and for this patient. So that, that is really the ultimate goal. It's uh, the prediction aspect is, is, you know, is, is just one aspect of it, but it's really about the, the drug target and the slowing um, by precisely drugging, uh, uh, drugging the disease driver in each patient. I totally agree. That's a very good point to emphasize. And I think they go hand in hand because uh, having an excellent drug target, but having a group of patients that vary tremendously going into the trial, it may not actually be possible to show that the drug is efficacious without having thousands of patients and nobody can afford to that. The challenge is to find a, um, a drug target that one can develop good drugs to, but also then to demonstrate that it works and in what patients it works. There are many examples yeah. in medical history where good drugs have been lost along the way because of uh, bad designer trials. Go ahead, Mark, you wanted? Well, well, the thing I wanted to bring out there is that actually, and, and, and with respect to Jesse, you know, G219S look two, it's a hyperactive kinase mutation. There are laboratory tools and uh, that really block that. And of course, those are now in phase three trials. Um, and so, so this this theoretical discussion that we have is actually non-theoretical, precisely at this point in time in, in our history. We, we actually are doing these on target engagement and it's, it's based on genetic studies. Um, However, and to, to your point though, Patrick, I think there are still risks with some of these approaches and particularly the risk that, that the, the patient variability is so great that we can't see signal, right? So the drugs could be working, but we, we have so much variability, we can't discern the, the signal from the noise and or that we don't know when. And, and that's something that I think 
you, you know, I, I'm sure you've thought about this, Jesse. You know, at what point is the best point to intervene? And I, I, ju I just don't think we could have a good handle on that. Is it in the early tremor, you know, sort of mild motor Parkinson's, or do we have to go even before that, before there's any evidence of uh, brainstem involvement? And so I think those issues are things that, that we should be thinking about and preparing ourselves for, because they're, they're really going to be challenging over the next decades. And it's even possible to intervene before there is any sign of disease, just the genetic mutation is present. So... Uh, but there, there's an ethical dilemma. Of course, not everybody with a LARC2 mutation will actually develop Parkinson's. And Jess, you know the numbers, they vary in different studies, 30 to 70% or something like that. So, so is it ethically correct to go into a population where a large portion are actually not destined to get Parkinson's and give them a drug that might have some risk and give them that drug for 10, 20 years. That's a very difficult ethical question. What are your thoughts on this, Jesse? Now we're talking about progression before the disease is even present. Yeah, um, it's, it's a very good question. And um, you know, I've done a lot of biomarker and observational studies um, over the last seven to eight years to try to figure out some of those markers and try to figure out or predict who, who is likely to be um, in a particular state you know, because we know that Parkinson's will start decades um, before it's actually manifested in motor symptoms, you know, ideally you do want to start earlier, but then, but then the question is, what, what do you really, what, uh, what is appropriate to, to start in someone who um, doesn't have some of those manifested motor um, conditions? So a lot of times we'll, we'll talk about exercise, which we know um, there's a lot of good research on exercise and people with Parkinson's that, you know, it can't hurt, you know, it, and it can only help. So I think exercise is a good thing for um, people like me who are at higher risk to start doing now and to do often and to do um, to really to really think about, um, you know, eating, um, eating better, eating the, the, you know, a lot of people talk about the Mediterranean diet, um, doing low inflammation type type foods, um, because we know that a lot of times what we know about LARC2 is um, its association with inflammation. So trying to um, get you know, better nutrition. Um, one of the things that I know for me personally, I look at and I work with my primary care physician on is that historically I've had low B12 and vitamin D levels that we know um, is good to be optimal for, for, for your brain. So um, you know, that's one thing that I'm um, really working on is getting my vitamin D and my B12 levels up. And of course, there's research into, you know, certain types of B12 that may be um, natural LARC2 inhibitors. Um, I can't really pronounce it. It starts with an A, adenosyl. It's the bioactive form of B12. So that's something that I'm very interested in, in learning about. So I think some of those lower risk um, um, interventions or maybe some of those repurposed drugs that have good safety profiles is something um, to think about in people who are at, are at higher risk for Parkinson's because of certain genetic variants. Um, you know, certain things that make sense for certain genetic variants, I think is important because I think it is important to start earlier um, because I think ultimately prevention is important. Yes, so oh, I think you made a great point and you are suggesting interventions that are probably very benign and good for your, one's health in general, exercise and healthy non-inflammatory diets. But it becomes more of an ethical issue when we have drugs that, that do things that are potentially preventing disease, but may do other things off target, or actually by preventing disease also cause other diseases or side effects. So uh, different ethical dilemma. But you did bring up something that I hope to come back to, Jesse. There are, might be ways of affecting progression. Now, before we go to Stephen, who's raised his hand, I've seen we've got a couple of questions coming in here, and we're going to address them. But I urge everybody to ask your questions in the Q&A field at the bottom of Zoom. You can see something to the right on my screen at the bottom there, Q&A. If you open that, you're able to uh, type in your questions there. But Stephen, you had raised your hand. Well, I just wanted to echo Jesse's point, which I think is really, really well made. I mean, it. it I mean, I think with the prodromal Parkinson's, the issue is going to be, you know, how potentially harmful is the intervention, and also how many people are going to get it. So, for instance, with GBA, we know that actually 
you know, aggregated across all variant carriers, only somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 percent of people will go on to get Parkinson's. Um, so actually, if you're going to give everyone who has that variant, a, you know, something 10 or 20 years in advance of disease, that's potentially a lot of money and potentially quite a lot of harm to people who will never get Parkinson's. Conversely, you know, LARC2, the penetrance is debated, but probably somewhere around 50%, um, maybe higher for, for certain variants. You know, so you could envisage that actually the sort of risk benefit balance kind of changes. A little bit there and also the drug itself you know if, if you've got something that is just completely you know has very very safe you might as well just put it in the water almost i mean you know it's uh, i mean i'm being i'm being facetious but you know the the the, the it's, these aren't sort of these aren't simple questions it's gonna you it's gonna have to be on each you know intervention you're talking about and you and what pathway you're talking about and what group of patients you're looking to give it to um but the principle of giving things to people in the prodromal state stratified somehow it certainly has legs although it will be extremely difficult to do and will require a completely different way of carrying out clinical trials over a much longer period of time which will be a huge challenge but you know and it's something we probably need to start thinking about now so i went to school in sweden uh, as a child and we had the fluorine lady who came once a week and we had to rinse our mouths with fluorine that's the ultimate uh, put it in the drinking water concept and um, preventing uh, dental decay. So, and there are other books where they put stuff in the drinking water, right? Aren't there? It's a brave new world. Something like that. Clements, you had raised your hand, but before we go to you, Clements, I just want to read a comment from Joy Milne. She says, Daniel Berg studied this question and she's referring to uh, Jesse, I think. The outcome result was that the greater percentage wanted to know if they could alter the course of the disease, as Jesse's saying. So clearly that is the ultimate aim for individuals. Everybody would like to slow this disease or even prevent it. And so do, do we as scientists. The question is if we can predict how quickly it will progress. And I have a question from Tim that I'm going to ask after Clemens makes his comment. Right. So I, I very much um, liked and, and sort of echoed the thoughts uh, that Stephen and, uh, and Jesse put forth, you know, primary prevention, which means preventing the disease from ever developing is, is great, but it's very tough. And, you know, we know that from other fields in me medicine, for example, you know, obesity, uh, in some uh, part diabetes, right? We know how primary prevention could work. Um, you know, simply lots of exercise, healthy diets, not too much, right? But it's very hard to do this. And so I think, so in my mind, actually, the, the quicker, a uh, path to success um, may be different. And, and that's actually what my patients also tell me, they come to the clinic, they already have Parkinson's disease, right? So the primary prevention is out, out of the, the barn. What they want to do is prevent the disease to prog progress to, uh, from developing debilitating complications. And, and we are fortunate as you know very well, right? That we have, uh, so many um, dopamine replacement therapies that work quite well for, for many patients during the first years of disease. But then as the clinical uh, disease severity progresses and cognitive and other complications develop, then we're, you know, we're not making headway anymore. Things are getting tough. And so- Cognitive decline is one of the major reasons a person with Parkinson's disease has to leave an independent living. Uh, so you're absolutely right. We talk, of course, all of, always about the motor symptoms or tradition we have, but it's in fact cognitive symptoms and falls that are the biggest right. dangers. Right. Could I ask so, a question to you, Clemens, because you were touching on this now and somebody put in the chat, it's uh, the person with the name anonymous attendee. How would you know whether a drug is working in the prodromal phase when uh, the person with Parkinson's disease is without symptoms. Exactly. So this is part of this very hard problem of, of primary prevention. And uh, I think in practice, we are sort of have, we'll have to inch our way backwards from when, if you look at the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's sort of time point zero, 
we're going to have to inch our way backwards uh, using, uh, for example, imaging as, 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 uh, of, of dopamine neuron activity as, as a marker of has this patient prodroma Parkinson's, does the, does the drug um, slow down the loss of dopamine neurons or does it slow down the loss of olfaction? Um, so I think th yeah, this, this is, this, uh, I think it's in terms of primary prevention, yeah, inching backwards is a way to go. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, the, most Im the most promising impact I think we'll have if we actually work with patients with Parkinson's and try to keep them in the honeymoon phase where dopamine replacement therapies work quite well and uh, make sure they stay there. So I promise to ask Tim Robinson's question. Uh, he writes, I have a genetic form of Parkinson's. My father had it. I've joined the 100,000 Genomes Project, but they told me that they can't pinpoint the genetic sequence that I share with my dad. When might this be possible and how will it help my consultant to ease my symptoms or ideally to cure me? Uh, who wants to have a go at this question? Well, I can take the first half, the genetic Part and then someone with more of a clinical background can maybe jump in. Um, the, the truth is that between you and your dad, you share about 1.5 billion DNA-based pairs that are going to be the same, right? Because of 50% inheritance. And, and that space is just too big to go sequence and, and guess our way through. Um, and and it's, it's unfortunate, it really is. And so what, what would be needed from a genetic perspective is, is really the full family for two or three generations with probably two or three affected individuals within that. Um, and, and, you know, otherwise you'd be seeing things that are shared but are not causative for your Parkinson's. Um, and so, so really that's, that's why over the years family studies have been so helpful in, in isolating single genetic loci. Um, uh, well, that means clinically, I, I'm not really qualified to say, so perhaps I'll- no, I'm going to ask Stephen about Stephen. that. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, let, let's imagine that they had the whole pedigree and it was possible to identify a new mutation perhaps in this family. And here's Stephen, the consultant, seeing uh, Tim Robinson, and he's found out there's a mutation in protein X. Why won't you be able to cure that patient immediately, Stephen? <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I mean, segregation studies are obviously very helpful and they get more and more helpful the more family members that you have, as, as, as Mark um, alludes to. I mean, the, the issue is that, um, you know, it's, it, it's very exciting for researchers like me when we find families that, that, that have Parkinson's, you know, passed on generation to generation to generation, because it often means you can find these new genes. And it, you know, and it really has moved the field along. I mean, alpha synuclein, which is the sort of basis of, of pretty much our kind of current thinking about Parkinson's, that was found through a pedigree in Italy. And that is really advanced you know, thinking from thinking of Parkinson's as a non-genetic to a genetic disease. So it really does have direct impacts. And, you know, now we are starting to develop therapies that are targeting alpha synuclein that may well have a disease modifying effect. I mean, the, the really awful and horrific thing about it is that of course it's slow. Um, and, you know, it's been, you know, 20, it's been 20 or 30 years since discovery of synuclein to the point where we might actually be able to do anything with it. And that has to speed up. That really has to speed up. Um, and COVID has shown us that it is possible to speed these things up. Um, and we need to do better. Um, as a scientific community, we need to do better. So my hope is that the advances that we're seeing in the lab and genetics might in future, you know, in the next five years be translating into meaningful things, particularly of unknown genes. Um, that would be my hope. And I hope we really learn the lessons from COVID. But, you know, at the moment, it's difficult. Um, but I really hope that we can change the way we, we, we do things and actually, you know, give something back to people like yourself who've really participated in research and haven't seen much benefit yet. So, so the message is that in Tim's case, if, if there were one day, you know, a discovery of a gene and in a large, his pedigree, perhaps then this gene could be important for other patients too. Uh, beyond the genetic forms, which you illustrated, Stephen, with alpha synuclein. But as you also illustrated, 24 years ago that sinuclein was identified as being 
you know, important in Parkinson's. We still don't have a therapy that is working based on targeting synuclein, and we still don't fully understand how synuclein is important. We just know it is important in some way. So it is a challenge. It's not just finding the protein. It's a question of what does that protein actually do when it's mutated? And then it's also a question of how do we develop a drug that will affect that process? And how do we ensure that drug gets into the brain? Can we ensure that drug is safe, et cetera, et cetera. These are very slow um, research processes, if you like. But I, I want to come back to the main theme again, genetic markers and the progression of Parkinson's. So I think everybody who's listening in here knows that there are about 5% or so of patients who have a genetic form of Parkinson's disease, like Jesse's dad, and the remainder have a mix of genetic risk and some unknown environmental or lifestyle factor. So that genetic risk that we don't fully understand, it's being mapped out and there are at least 90 places in the genome and the numbers growing year by year, 90 places in the genome that seem to influence genetic risk a little bit, some a lot, some just a tiny bit. And GBA, the gene that you're particularly interested in, Stephen, and uh, I think we're going to have Clemens talk also about GBA in the context of cognition soon, uh, that gene influences it quite a lot, but it's not sufficient to know whether or not you're going to get the disease. I mean, you just have an increased risk. And all we actually know from all those studies is that these genes influence the likelihood of getting the disease. It's a yes or no binary outcome. Parkinson's or not Parkinson's, that's how they're designed. And we don't know for sure that these genetic risk loci actually affect progression. And I want you to talk a little bit about this, Clemens, because you had a wonderful paper that came out earlier this year that explored in a very large number of individuals, very many risk loci, potential risk loci. And you asked the question whether they influence progression. And I think you were particularly interested in cognitive decline, right? Right. So we wanted to ask the question, what are the genetic variants uh, that predict how a patient will be doing in the future? And, and that's really based on uh, patients coming to the clinic, they already have Parkinson's disease and they want to know how they will be doing in the future, not so much what was the risk uh, variant, increasing the risk you know, to, to, to end up in the clinic. And, and, and so we, we set out on this quest to do a whole genome genotyping, uh, looking at each variant at a time to see which ones are linked to an increased risk uh, of dementia. That was our primary readout uh, over time. And so these patients, I should say this, this is a, a large, um, you can't do this alone, incredible effort to longitudinally uh, follow these patients over 12 years uh, overall. And so it's a global effort, uh, 18 cohorts participating. Altogether, we had uh, 3,800 patients, which were followed with more than 30,000 study visits over time. And uh, we chose to look at uh, dementia as uh, as our primary reader. So we wanted to use the genome to predict who will develop dementia and who will not. And why dementia? Because it's, it's, a, it, it's uh, incredibly important for patients because it has uh, the major impact on the quality of life. Can, can a patient live alone or um, enjoy life or, or, or not? And it's also one of the clinical features that actually can be, um, that is a relatively robust um, uh, as, and can be robustly measured. Yeah. And could you tell us a little bit about the outcome? I mean, I, this yeah. is very uh, fancy yeah. science. It's not easy to present in a general context, but right. you know, right. what, what were your top hits? Uh, exactly. So we did this genome-wide search, and and we we found uh, five um, leads. One uh, one a novel uh, sy synaptic locus called the RIMS2 uh, locus, where we found variants in in this locus uh, associated with a um, more than fourfold 
higher risk of developing dementia, so much more. I'm going to help the uh, lay public understand that synapse is the place where the two nerve cells communicate with each other. So this yes. is a gene that somehow affects the communication between nerve cells. Correct, I, I, exactly. And actually, uh, well, what it does, it, it, it docks synaptic vesicles to the presynaptic membrane. And so, so if your nerve cells need to communicate with each other, you need to move the neurotransmitters from one nerve ending to, uh, into the, the cleft between the two neurons. And to do this, um, you need to dock synaptic vesicles. And so the RIMS uh, two and th this RIM family of proteins uh, anchors uh, synaptic vesicles to the synapse. And could you then explain if we, if we put it in the perspective of, let's say, Jesse's father. So yeah. at the individual level, if, if one has the risk variant in this synaptic protein gene, uh, how much greater risk over a time period? It was 11 years, I think you said you studied. Yeah, yeah up to 12 years on average. Up to 12 years. Six years. Yeah, so, yeah so, so in the six, 12 year time window, how much greater risk? of developing dementia would one have if one carried the, the, the bad version of the gene? Right, uh, of, of 4.7 fold higher risk of, of, of dementia. It's easier to think of it in a different way. So if you don't have the risk variant, uh, patients without the risk variant, 10% of them will develop dementia within 10 years. But patients who carry the risk variants, uh, about 47% will develop dementia at 10 years. So, so it's the difference between 10 and 47%. Quite substantial. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and so that was a novel locus we found. We found two other suggestive novel loci. Uh, one is called Vivox, and the other one, TMM 108. Um, and we, we also confirmed two. Um, genes that have been previously uh, implicated, one uh, with very high level of evidence, GBA that Stephen uh, has already been mm -hmm. doing clinical trials on, and we have been involved in other uh, clinical trials on that. So GBA, uh, as, as you know, previously shown, increased the risk for dementia uh, about twofold. And interestingly, the, the major uh, Alzheimer's gene, APOE, also increased the risk of dementia in Parkinson's patients by about 1.5 fold. So, so, so those, those were really uh, interesting, uh, important findings. And it's really important for several reasons. Number one, um, what we want is targets for drugs to slow disease progression. And so if a gene is associated with rapid progression, drugs that correct um, the gene defect should be prime candidates to slow the disease progression. You just answered a question, I think, from anonymous attendee. I'm not sure if it's the same anonymous attendee. It says, for Clements, do these loci in PD patients overlap with loci in other patients with dementia without Parkinson's, for example, Alzheimer's and MS? And right. I think you just said in one case there, there was some overlap. Right. So that's really a fascinating question. And, and, and if what we're really... Um, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. And I think what we'll see over the next years is that we, we have this, this simplistic and really uh, it's sort of um, 19th century uh, classifications of this neurologic disease based on clinical symptoms. And I think what we will be doing over in the future is to really redefine, reinvent neurology based, based on genetics. And so for example, for the, for the progression genes, we, so some of the, gene, the, the genes we found are over, uh, overlapping with Alzheimer's, APOE and VVOX, which is also an Alzheimer's risk variant. Others are overlapping with Lewy body dementia, um, GBA and APOE, and others seem to be um, only linked to rapid progression in Parkinson's disease. So, um, you know, this, this sort of strict, um, separation in silos of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's dementia uh, is, I think, if you look at the brains on a neuropathological and at a genetic level, doesn't make sense. You're right.
think you're right. And of course, that is a painful reality for many of us who say that we study Parkinson's disease. We actually study neurodegenerative disease uh, where there are clinical features of Parkinsonism, but they have lots of pathology. And Jesse, you mentioned in your father's case that he had not just synuclein aggregates, but he also had tau tangles, if I'm not mistaken. So here we have overlap. And Alberto Spey, a good friend and a debater that I frequently battle on Twitter with, he says Parkinson's doesn't exist. And of course, I am an editor of the journal Parkinson's Disease, and that's a bit difficult to handle. It's, bit, it's hard for a, for a foundation called Cure Parkinson's if the disease doesn't exist. But I, I, I think you're well, absolutely actually, right. I have, was... a, I have a solution for you uh, that might be very beneficial for uh, you know, what you're doing. I, I think there might be 20, 50 Parkinson's diseases. And so you might have you know, 20 sub, subgermals in the future. Uh, it, well, or just call it Journal of Parkinson's Diseases. Uh, yeah. I think that's more accurate. But will the borders between the different versions of disease be absolutely watertight at the molecular level? And I don't think so. And I, I would argue uh, that if you have two identical twins that develop Parkinson's diseases, and they have the same genetic risk, of course. They're not exposed to exactly the same environment, and maybe their diseases would progress differently and look quite different. So, uh, you know, it's it's not all it's not all in our DNA in this case. This disease. There's some other thing that we don't understand, or some other things we don't understand that affect progression. But come, I'm going to come back now um, and ask you, Clements, and then I'm going to let Jesse comment on this. So, you found this new locus that you weren't anticipating perhaps to be important for progression into dementia, which is a synaptic protein. Is a drug company going to pick this up? Is this something that now will lead to an effort to look for therapies that will actually slow progression as opposed to prevent the disease from occurring in the first place? Exactly. So that, that, that's one of the goals. And so, so, Practically, what what needs what we need to do and what we are trying to do is uh, this next step is we have to number one flesh out really the mechanism. How do you go from this change in base pair to uh, a cellular problem? That's the first step. step. Second step is to find a new drug. We need a druggable assay, meaning we need to have some simple, robust assay that we can roll out in a large scale and then uh, put um, do drug screens, test chemicals to reverse the defect. So, so those are the next two hard um, steps that we're working towards, yeah. So how many weeks will this take? <laughs> yes, well, I, so it's actually, um, you know, so, it, it's really you. I know you're joking with weeks, and and uh, yeah, it, it can't be done in weeks. But it could be. It could be done much faster than we currently are doing it. And it's simply. It's not a question of we have the technology. We know what to do. It's simply a question of funding. Uh, with uh, it's simply a question of in having enough funding um, and investment to do what needs to be done. You know massively parallel uh, and move things rapidly forward. But we don't have this, so, so we have to do things serially, one step at a time, and that pushes you know, things out into years, into many years, in, as opposed to months. And Jesse, the question I was going to ask you when you hear this, uh, oh, here's an interesting new locus, uh, uh, dementia risk goes from 10 to 47%, if 10%, that's not a real number perhaps, but, it goes up by a factor of four to five. Or was it actually 10% in your... Yes, that, that, uh, that's, it was, okay. Yeah, that's based right. on the data, uh, 10 years. Yeah. So Jesse, when you hear this, what do you think as a, the daughter of somebody who had Parkinson's disease and a person who's carrying a risk gene, how do you feel about this, that there's this interesting new area, but it's not going to lead to a therapy within the foreseeable five years? next five years or so, it's going to take a long time. Right. And there's definitely a sense of urgency from the Parkinson's community. And, and 
you know, I, I believe all researchers, you know, feel this, that same sense of urgency. And I think that's why those collaborations and those consortiums and people working together is so important um, so that we can, you know, build awareness and advocates, you know, really help um, advocate for additional funding um, to work with governments um, to kind of um, bring more spotlight in, in the in the area of neurodegenerative diseases. And, um, you know, I think it really helps when people work together um, and share data and we're not so siloed um, and that we're, you know, we share that genetic information uh, across researchers. Um, so I think that that's, that's really, really important. Um, you know, when, when I hear that is, what can we do to work together to, to take that piece of knowledge and maybe another researcher can, um, you know, use those those data sets and what they're working on, and kind of work together in some of those things to kind of speed speed the process. Because you know, there's definitely a sense of urgency. People are people are suffering. You know, um, it's not just about the next generation; it's people that are suffering now, and they can't wait. You know, so you know, it's what do we do to work together to to bring that synergy to so that we um, take the, this new knowledge and that we use it and we spread it and um, everybody can benefit from that. Well, I can promise you, Jesse, lots of people have seen uh, the paper from Clemens and his team. And of course, we're very intrigued by this. I'm sure lots of people are thinking about this issue, but perhaps I could ask Stephen, if you could, in a minute, we only have about three and a half minutes to go, if you could describe one way of speeding up the process potentially in the best of worlds. Imagine if there is an existing drug that's been shown to be safe and used for another disease that happens to affect Clemens gene in a way that makes sense in the assay that Clemens still doesn't have ready. And Mark would perhaps be one of the people who would be working on this assay. So imagine if that drug already existed, how could one then speed up the process of getting this into patients as opposed to taking a completely new chemical entity generated by a drug company and developing that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, of course, that's, that's sort of what we did with Ambroxol, although we, we would have liked it to be faster. I mean, the main barriers were regulatory. I mean, it still took a long time to get it, you know, ethical approval to do it. And and also, you know, there was, an, a, a, because we didn't have a lot of money, we were, you know, building the protocol and putting it together took a bit of time. I mean, to be honest, that all of those, um, all of those kind of clerical exercises and governance exercises important than they are can be squeezed and they and they have been squeezed. I mean, for instance, in the UK, the recovery trial, which is the COVID trial that showed that, that steroids um, were, in a, were an effective treatment for, for COVID was up and running within two weeks and that recruited, I don't know how many, but thousands and thousands of patients. And I think there is, it's starting to get through to researchers and regulators alike that actually it doesn't need to take as long as it's it's been taking. And, you know, God knows there are plenty of bad things that go out of COVID, but one of the legacies will hopefully be that actually clinical trials will be driven for faster and also delivered more sensibly, like, for instance, allowing remote assessment of patients, you know, whereas before they'd have to come in, you know, things that actually just make it practically, I mean, it's not rocket science, it's just things that practically make it easier and quicker to run these trials. Thank you. I think that's a great statement. And I heard a Swedish podcast with the global head of research at Pfizer, Mikael Dolstein, who is a Swede. And he uh, told the story that they decided to try to develop the vaccine within a time frame of about six, seven hours on March 1st, when they had a series of phone calls on a Sunday, I believe it was. And they said, okay, we're gonna try to develop this vaccine and have it ready for testing or, or, or approval, I guess, in October. And they all agreed this was completely crazy done before but they said let's have a go and let's throw everything we have in terms of resources at this and it actually sort of worked so maybe it's also part of our mindset uh, regulatory bodies and uh, and scientists have to start thinking in a different way and have the sense of urgency that you expressed jesse we're actually running out of time jesse you mentioned maybe lifestyle factors can affect progression that's an important thing i was hoping to get back to that but we are uh, approaching the very end. And I just want to thank all the panelists. If you, is there any urgent final message anybody wants to give to our audience? Yes, uh, I would like to thank the audience for tuning in. And I would, uh, I wanted to tell you that this is really a team sport. It takes scientists, physicians, and it 
takes uh, you, patients and, and supporters to, to help us move things forward. So thank you for all you do and, and keep, keep at it. I think that is a great last word. Without the patients, none of the things that we talked about would be possible to do. And of course, they're only meaningful if they actually affect patients. That's what it's all about. Debbie Cowan asks the very last question, when will this be available for replay afterwards, this webinar? Usually about 24 hours later, you will see it on a YouTube channel that you can find on Kill Parkinson's. Parkinson's with an S, several Parkinson's diseases uh, on their webpage. Thank you everyone who's tuned in and thank you to the panelists and bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye everybody.